Welcome everybody to uh, the sixth webinar now in the Ultimate Trading Guide webinar series. Super excited for this one. Both we're going to be talking about screening and routines, uh, two crucial elements of any uh, professional trader's um, process, and uh, should be a real good one. We're going to go through a lot of screening templates uh, that hopefully should give you a ton of ideas and set you on the path uh, to developing your own system to consistently find uh, top trading ideas. Um, so with that, right, I think I'll hand it over to you. Help, sorry, I'll hand it over to you, and let's go ahead and dive in. Yes, so framework six with regards to screening and routines. So if you haven't downloaded the ultimate trading guide just yet, uh, the link Richard will paste in uh, to to the chat. You could download that. Uh, all we want is you know you guys to pass it forward if you find it useful. If you have any suggestions, reach out to us. It could be on YouTube, um, you know, in the, in the webinar chat right now. And we're always looking to make this resource uh, much much better over the coming. Uh, weeks, months, and years. Um, <clears throat> start off with a quote, like we always do. So this one is about, you know, the 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 webinar we have today is about routines and screening. So this one from uh, John Maxwell covers it pretty well. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret, the secret of your success is found in your routine. So a lot of professional traders, investors, money managers, portfolio managers, when when you do this for a living and you do this professionally. Uh, they have a very set routine that they follow so that they can extract the most out of their day, but also excel at what they're doing consistently. Now, routines are not just confined to or specialized to, to you know, being a trader or investor. It's any profession, like we've spoken about, many of the habits that we have outside of our trading carry over into our trading. So uh, if we need to bring all of that, you know, professionalism, if, you, if you're working a nine to five job, uh, that needs to carry over to your trading. It's no different. If anything, uh, trading and investing and making that a profession is is 10 times harder than uh, a nine to five and getting a bachelor's or a master's degree. So uh, routines, you know, this is what we'll discuss today. We'll kind of get into the depths of what successful traders do, why they find success uh, doing that, and what are some of the key elements that, you know, the six steps that we've broken it down into uh, for having your own trading routine. So the agenda today is the importance of routines, the six key steps. We'll get into screening, building a universe list, a focus list, and then uh, the six steps of creating a screen, kind of working your way backwards based on, you know, hey, I see a stock break out. Now, how do I, you know, work my way backwards from uh, looking at a successful winner, you know, uh, uh, to the long side or the short side, and then building a screen based on that, kind of working your way backwards. Hey everyone, just want to pause you right there for a second and make sure you guys are aware of an awesome resource related to screening and routines that we just released. Uh, this is the Ultimate Screening Guide, a free email course. It covers seven key lessons regarding daily routines, weekly routines, and has a ton of uh, screening templates that we use personally and were developed by top traders like Oliver Kell and other U.S. investing champions 100% free. As I mentioned, you just have to visit dfi.com slash screening dash guide and just basically enter out your info and we'll basically send the lessons right to your email inbox. So with that, let's get back to the webinar. So uh, we'll start with the importance of trading routines. Um, something before I go to the next slide is a lot of traders that are stage one and two traders don't think this is a important aspect. What they feel is more important is uh, if they can eye a setup, if they can, uh, you know, just have a winner in the markets uh, without doing any of the work and kind of seek some sort of shortcut to, to get to where they want to get to. Um, that's not how, you know, successful traders that we know we have, you know, uh, worked with uh, as well over the past couple of years kind of got to where they are now. They all have established routines and it's a very key part of their success, um, including, you know, a believe leads into their mindset as well. So um, the importance of having a trading routine is basically uh, you, you want to be in tune with the markets. You want to be in tune with, it doesn't matter if you're a long side trader, short side trader, uh, what style you have, you need some sort of routine that's focused on the market so that you could, you're always in tune. So if the market's in correction, you can have a more simplified routine to say, hey, I just 
check the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Maybe I review the components of the NASDAQ. We're still in a correction and you're still in sync as to what's going on, right? That could be a very simple routine that you have during corrections. Or when we're in uptrend and that's the style of trade, you know, trading you have or uh, the, the style of trading that you're doing in the markets, then it could be a little bit more elaborate. You know, then you get, you know, I need a focus list of five to six ideas. How do I get to that? Uh, and though, what are the steps? Um, the second point we have is it, it, it enforces you to listen, I would say, to the markets rather than build an opinion, kind of a 30,000 feet opinion. So going through, reviewing a whole bunch of charts, reviewing the indexes, reviewing uh, what whatever style of trading you have consistently will not only keep you in tune with what the market is trying to tell you, that's likely the most important story you should be you should know anyways regardless of the headlines etc but it keeps you uh it, you get better when you do your routines right as you go through and let's say you you have these six steps that you follow and you do that 300 times over in a year you'll find opportunities to improve yourself and better your game as you iterate over that you know those six steps again and again uh over time right so uh it forces you to be aware of your portfolio progress. I think this one's most important for stage one and two traders is that ha they have a lack of awareness of what their positioning is. They don't know, like we spoke about in the last webinar with respect to their position size, open risk, all those metrics. It, you need to be aware of it because you want to treat it like a business. You want to come in, do this professionally. You should know, oh, hey, if all my stops hit, I'll, my portfolio is going to be down four and a half percent from the highs. If this position hits, you know, um, if there's a gap down on a particular position or there's news after hours on that position, you need to be, you know, uh, it, you need to know your mathematical numbers to, to, to in order for you to make a really good decision that's not purely based on emotion, even though we can't negate some of those emotions. Um, all long-term and successful traders have established a routine. So you could look at, you know, folks like uh, William O'Neill, right? Uh, Dan Zanger, Minervini, uh, Stan Weinstein, Oliver Kell, uh, any, anybody that you see as a six, you know, a success story in the markets, they have some way, shape or form of following a very set, you know, established routine. So if someone's tracking net new high lows, like we spoke about in recent webinars, right? You track net new high lows and they do it every day. Someone like John Boyd. So he does it every day and that allows him, that's part of his routine and it allows him to be in sync with the markets. That's what we spoke about as our first point. And second, it allows him as he's done that over three, four, five years, now he sees patterns in that, right? So that's the next thing. The art of trading is basically pattern recognition, right? And the more you iterate over your routines, the better you will be at that pattern recognition in the back of your mind. And at the end of the day, you're going to be the subject matter ex expert or you have to be the subject matter expert at whatever your trading style is for you to be a professional in it at the end of the day. So for part-time traders, it's equally as important uh, to have some sort of regular routine. So I see a lot of people, you know, I want to subscribe to something that just tells me it. And I just want to go at 930. If price moves above a, a certain price, I will go buy it and I've done no other homework, just to the pure fact that I've subscribed to something that might work in a really, really good market. You know, you have pivots, you set alert, you go buy, and then you, you're buying and selling based on someone else's homework. It works you know, in a really, really, really good market, like a 2020 market, it doesn't work 90% of the time because you need to take that, even if you value someone else's opinion, even if you go out there and subtract, you need to do that additional homework to say, hey, okay, uh, they're watching this stock. I I've researched it. I think it fits my entry tactics and, and my edges. I see, you know, there's value in, in pursuing this trade but you have to add multiple layers, even if you're part-time. So being part-time is something that I hear is an excuse. I don't have time. I just need someone to tell me what to do. Uh, and the last time I checked, none of the people that I know that are successful uh, have been successful that way uh, for a very, very long time. So that might be a short-term kind of you know gambling type of deal. But if you want to do it professionally, you have to do it by yourself. Richard, anything to add on why you think you know trading routines are important? Um, and, and why traders should have them. 
Yeah, I, I think it's it's a matter of actually preparing for for anything that can happen. Um, you know, you, you can't judge outputs unless your inputs are consistent. So you don't actually know if your process works unless you, you do it every day, you do it every single week, you, you find ideas, execute on them. Uh, you don't know which piece is missing unless you do each of them consistently. And to, to the last bullet here, I think for part-time traders, especially people who work full times during the week, uh, the weekly routine, which is more what we're focused on today, is even more important than for people who can watch the markets. Uh, because without that consistent process of staying in tune with what the market health is doing, finding ideas on a more long-term weekly chart basis, um, you're not really able to, to execute well in the market. So um, you know, if you look at any performance type endeavor, you know, athletes are an easy one. Uh, they're not going to step up to the plate, bottom of the ninth inning uh, with, with two runners on and expect to do well unless they have put in the hours, work their way up from the minor leagues, uh, study game films, study the pitchers, you know, do everything possible so that they can go out there and execute. Um, going up there and just hoping and, and saying, hey, this stock is moving. This person called it out. Um, I'm going to give it a shot. It might work once or twice, but again, over the long term, and that's what we're trying to do here. How do we successfully trade for decades to really compound our accounts? Over the long term, you have to have your own process uh, to, to do well, uh, because that's what's going to allow you to make something that that fits. You know, if you do work full time, you'll you'll create something that works and fits that that the time that you have allotted. So uh, yeah, I, I think this is critical and it's not as sexy as the key setups or entry tactics, but um, if you nail down your routine, you nail down risk management, you're like 95% of the way there, I, I think of, of really having success long-term. Awesome. So next is we'll, we'll dive into, I guess, what is a trading routine, right? So it's a consistent series of steps and tasks that you perform uh, or it could be something, let's say you don't have one today, right? So you can break it down into asking yourself questions. Uh, what am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to accomplish uh, my actions in the market should be associated with my routine. So that's something that you could have as a goal. Now you work your way backwards on, uh, I'm finding myself being late to certain stocks or being, you know, I should be buying this stock here, but I'm not able to buy it here because I've, I don't have a watch list. I don't have a focus list. I'm keeping track of uh, Twitter timelines, uh, you know, or, or, you know, following people and going, you know, my actions are associated with their commands or tweets. So those things are something that I used to do. That's why I kind of talk about it a lot initially where you go out and follow people or you go out and you don't have a routine, but you think that when the market opens, you can kind of figure it out day to day. That's how I used to be when I started. Now, how do we move those traders? And so that's stage one and two traders from that kind of randomness as to, you know, how they, how they go about their business in the markets to having something structured. So a lot of the homework that you guys will be doing as investors and traders will be when the market is not open right? All your potential actions, your if else scenarios, your, you know, if this happens and, you know, the stock moves up and then we see a breakout failure, what are your associated actions going to be? So that's the second thing. Des design to manage your portfolio, find new ideas and prepare for any actions. So it's, it's, you should have much of what you're doing in the back of your mind. And then as the market moves, it's triggering some sort of action that you've kind of pre-planned at the end of the day, right? Uh, not always are your routine, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to be 100% of the time your routines will cover your actions. Maybe something happens in the market midday and now you have to kind of adjust on, you know, uh, and, and kind of, you know, go away from what you plan. That's always going to be part and parcel of how the market works. But most of the time, as you gain experience, you could be in different, you know, new cycles, or you know, Fed-related events or CPI things of the, that nature become a lot more important in downtrends because the market's news-driven. Then you have to, as you go through your routines, you'll incorporate bits and pieces of those depending on the type of the you know type of market that we're in. Uh, Richard, anything else you know to to add on what is a trading routine? 
Yeah, taking a step back a little bit, um, it, and I'm kind of speaking to people who right now feel that they don't really have a routine uh, at all, or it's not quite dialed in. Um, you know, it's kind of like eating healthy to lose weight. You want to kind of build up to it where, you know, at first you try to just do some something consistently, whether that's check new highs, new lows, then you add a piece here, a piece there. We're going to be giving specifics and, and ideas that you can incorporate in your routines. And just like the setups, just like the entry tactics, take what you like, incorporate it, test it. Does it work for you? Uh, add it to your process. But um, the key thing is just set up something that you can do consistently 80%, 90% of the, the time, building up to that 100% of the time. Don't start with all these tasks, this list of 20 things that you have to do, and then you you end up doing none of it, right? Um, you know, you build a whole fitness plan that you're going to go to the gym and do all these exercises, all these different sets, X amounts, and then you can do that. You can sustain that for three days and then you get you get distracted and, and can't, can't do any of it. Start simple, start basic, build up to it. Um, but you'll find start that sustainable, really sustainable. Like, exactly. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So that's not related so, to that slide at all, but I think it is important. <laughs> yeah. So as humans, we, we always, we, we do best when we perform things repetitively. So that could be, you know, if you drop everything today and you start making chairs tomorrow, right. And you make chairs for three months. I'm pretty sure all of us could master that easily right you'll figure out a process you'll figure out a way you'll break that down into hey i need to uh maybe do the legs first and then do the back of the chair etc might not be so a good chair point, but it, <laughs> so the point is it, as long as you do it over a span of time you will master it that's kind of Bill the proof. key and then if you do it exactly at, to, to what richard said if don't go out there and make the most complex routine and then you're discouraged because you can't maintain it, right? That's That discourages a lot of people and then it sends them in the wrong direction where they're looking for shortcuts. So start with something sustainable, do that over and over again. And then if that becomes part of your lifestyle and it becomes an habit, you know, a habit of yours, only then you can, you know, add something to it and then make that a, a habit. So think of it as you're, you're iterating over a span of six to seven years, right? You're investing your time and you want something out of this and the rewards are amazing, right? Traders have triple digit returns. They compound their gains and this is what they're doing. They have a very specific routine. They, they manage things professionally, but it's, it's over a cycle of, you know, a number of years and it's no different in trading and investing. So building a chair, very similar to any other, you know, routine you have in life. Uh, it, 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 has to be over a span of time has to be done repetitively so uh, we're pretty much saying the same thing in the last bullet here is it's going to have a positive impact what i'm trying to do here is trying to convince you guys that if you don't have one you have to have one in order to be successful it's as important if not more important to have a routine than it is to let's say have five entry tactics or, or uh, four edges in the market, et cetera. If, if you have one edge, one entry tactic and a trading routine around it, you will do far, you know, you'll do much better in terms of performance at the end of the day than if you have four uh, edges and four entry tactics and no trading routine, right? Because then the, you're, you're offline when the markets close, Decision making, uh, you know, scenarios are not there, and when the market's real time, all you're doing is going on emotions. So I see a lot of people ref referring to deep work by Cal Newport. That one's a good one. It emphasizes, you know, kind of mastery of a certain topic or subject or whatever you spe want to specialize in. Atomic Habits is another good one. The Power of Habit. I haven't read that one, so that's probably a good one. I'll take a look at. Uh, but some of those books kind of say this same thing. Right. You need to have a routine. As humans, we function in a way where when we do things repetitively, we naturally excel at those things. So yeah. the second you know, part of it is how long should a routine take? And I really want to, you know, uh, this goes back to what Richard was saying. You do not. The, the idea here today is to not accomplish, you know, the most complicated routine that you could possibly have that covers all if else scenarios and you can have the best focus that's not the idea if you don't have one start very simple but have it you know be sustainable just like you know a, a diet like richard said you know having a diet is important 
Uh, and a sustainable diet is also important because then over a long span of time, you see really good results. Um, it's no different with routine. So generally, I think, you know, stage one and two traders should keep it simple, make focus on making it a habit. So a daily routine could be 30 minutes. So 30 minutes out of 24 hours is a, is a pretty fair ask for you to move towards stage two, right? As you move towards stage two, then you can, you know, you can make it a little bit more complicated. You've done your basics, right? You, you know, you follow very, a very simple process. And then as you move to stage three, traders get very complicated, in my opinion. You know, you don't have to make it complicated just because you're a stage three. Some people look at, you know, volatility indicators, CPIs, they, they go crazy with Fed, you know, what, how many, uh, you know, how much money the Fed's pumping into the markets, the economic calendars, et cetera. They make it super fancy. If that's, you know, you get to that stage, you get to that stage. But as stage one, two, that's that's our biggest audience today. Just have something sustainable, simple that, you know, you get it done and you're excited to see the market the next day. And you do that over a span of 300 times in a year or more, you will see results and you will naturally improve your game over a span of time. So Richard, anything to add? I don't have much as, you know, the bullet points here cover a lot of what we want to say. So. Yeah. So what I, what I do want to add is my routines and doing them every day is what it gives. It helps inform me about where everything is going. Uh, if you ever see a, a tweet from Oliver or a tweet from Mark Minervini, and then it, you know, they notice improvement in a group and then magically, you know, the next month that group is the top performer. They're not just pulling that out of a hat. They're noticing things that they saw in their routines, subtle improvements of the groups moving together, and all that couldn't be possible if they didn't have a consistent go-to routine that you know informs them about what stocks are doing, where is rotation going, where what stocks are improving, what groups are performing. Um, so just getting it done and, and staying in tune with the market, over time, you'll be amazed about what you noticed and how you really pick up on the themes and where the puck is going. You'll notice things before anyone else if you do a consistent routine every single day. Um, I, I kind of uh, write for myself and for everybody else kind of a, a daily newsletter, which breaks down very simply the markets, top groups, stocks I'm noticing that day, and just doing those few things, and it, 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 takes, it takes about 30 minutes to do, really helps me stay in tune with uh the leadership you know what's developing leadership what are proper buy points all of that so i can't emphasize enough if you don't have one um that should be your number one goal after this webinar if you're watching this and don't have a routine go ahead create a basic one and, and start doing it this weekend start tomorrow uh we'll start today actually so uh yeah that that's all i'll add Oh, awesome. and, so, and right. Actually, do you want to talk about, you know, how long do your routines, routines typically take? I'd say my weekend one's about an hour and a half. Um, and then I also kind of make a video out of it. And then on a daily basis, it's probably about 30, 30 minutes or so. Is that, is that kind of similar to yours? Yeah, my, my, my daily one is about 45 minutes to an hour. I just, I tend to do it a little bit longer on purpose because I feel like if I get the work in, I just, I'm naturally more confident the next day. Right. That's just how I operate. Uh, if, if I do something in 30, you know, if I if I do it in 15 or 20 minutes, I don't feel like I've put the work in. So it, it's just how I function. It doesn't mean it has to be, 40, you know, 45 minutes. And then the weekends, I spend quite a bit of time. You know, I will go through the whole Russell um, 2000 just to get a full idea of what's going on. Uh, flip, you know, thousands of some people, you know, uh, make a mockery out of that. Hey, why do you need to spend so much time? It's more so when it's, it's the primary source of what you're doing as, as you know, a, a trader or investor in the markets, then you have to make that, you know, it's the biggest deal for you at the end of the day. Right. Whereas uh, as if you're a part-time, then obviously you allocate your time according to your needs. So for me, the weekends are about two, two hours. So two, two and a half hours easily. So, yep, perfect. Uh, next, we'll get into the components. So uh, Richard's done a really good job of breaking down into, you know, what are some of the components that you could have uh, that, that can be part of your uh, trading routine? So the first one is, you know, we'll cover both the bottom up and the top down approach with market analysis. So it could be, you know, some traders I see uh, look at stocks only 
And if they have enough setups, then they work their way up to the group and then they go to the markets to see what's going on. Some traders look at the market as kind of their first filter. And if the market's not good, then they don't go in. You know, they kind of stop, you know, there, maybe look at groups, but don't go into individual stuff. We'll cover both approaches. Um, what What is right is what's right for you at the end of the day. Don't forget that. We, I've seen traders, you know, we've seen traders that are successful both um, in terms of, uh, you know, it, having a top down or a bottom up approach. So it's not really uh, something that is, hey, this is the right way and the other way is the wrong way. Both in their own ways are right. And we'll discuss why both of them. And at the end of the day, you're doing both, right? Uh, second, portfolio and post analysis. Most important for stage one, two traders to have some awareness of what is my exposure? How much money am I going to lose tomorrow, right? As stage one, two traders, if you just ask yourself that question, you know, if this happens, I'm losing this much. What your your focus is? You're trying to curb your losses, and if you curb your losses, naturally you'll be a winner in the markets one day, right? So, what what's going to happen if this thing pulls back in? Am I giving away much of the progress that I've made? That's boom bust phase. That's stage two phase, right? And how do you move from stage two to three? You you try to get rid of those ebbs and flow. You know the the ebbs. Uh, it, you know, the pullbacks that you see in your equity curve. So you can consistently push those up bit by bit to have an uptrending equity curve. So we'll get into that a little bit as well. Screening. Uh, and then the last one is creating your ga game plan. Richard, anything uh, to add there? No, we'll dive deeper into each of these components yep. separately. So um, yeah, I think we can move on here. So before we begin, I just want to give everybody kind of a, a full idea Idea, idea of what we'll try to accomplish today. Now, this is something that's taken me quite a while. Uh, this is over a span of six to eight years now, right? So it's not something that I pull together just in a day, in a day as to what I do. And this is my weekend routine where I said it takes me, you know, uh, two plus hours to kind of get through all of this stuff. So I do some, you know, screening. Uh, of the markets, I look at IPZ50, I look at S&P 500, NASDAQ, Russell, uh, their components, try to identify what's going on on an individual name, uh, you know, names that exist within those um, markets, uh, just to get a feel, an uh, overall feel. And this alone, you know, 2000 stocks, 100 and 500, some of them overlap, obviously. So I'm flipping about 2600, if you just say, you know, in terms of charts, um, just to get a good idea. Of, of what's going on in the markets. Then I'm running a few screens that are very related to my edges and entry tactics in the markets. So I, I could run an inside day screen. I could run, you know, base, look for bases, a three weeks tight, new highs, all time highs. Doesn't matter what you do, but I, you know, I tend to screen the markets to, to, to get the second type of feel as to what, what are my scans saying that align a little bit more with my edges and entry tactics. I then review my existing positions. I think this one's most important because it, when you're in an uptrend and things are looking good, you're kind of, you know, uh, you're on autopilot and all you're doing is, hey, I'm going to move my stops up. You know, uh, I want to make sure I realize some gains uh, on this particular uptrend or if a stock does this, you know, these are my weakest positions. So if the market were to pull in and have a stress test, like we spoke about with the market cycles, then my actions are going to be X, Y, Z. I'm going to get rid of my weakest stocks. Right. The third one is I report, you know, the uh, the trader line report, the top 10 report. Uh, this is something that I value, you know, someone else, you know, Ross's opinion a lot. So I go out and review his report, see what he's saying about the markets um, and, and, you know, his focus list that he publishes and try to, you know, see if there's anything that I've missed. And there's no harm, in, I, I would say, in getting a second opinion, as long as it's a second opinion and not a primary opinion at the end of the day, right? So, I, you know, am I missing something? Am I not seeing the markets clearly? What am I doing that, you know, is it in line with what he's seeing? Maybe, I, you know, sometimes I completely disagree with Ross and what he's seeing. I, I think that's perfectly fine at the end of the day. That what That's what makes you a trader. It's an individual sport at the end, end of the day. And everybody has their own opinions and you kind of have bank on that when you're wrong. You know, I'll go out. Uh, the market's about to turn. Ross is saying that I don't believe it. Two days later, I do. <laughs> so, so you learn through those experiences and you get better, right? And I value his opinion because he's been in the markets for three decades, and I'm, 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 not, I'm you know, I'm closer to 10, 12 years, uh, you know, uh, right now. So, uh, the second 
portion of it is updating. You know, I have a set of watch lists that I maintain. Uh, that's kind of my, you know, wheelhouse where the gappers watch list is the, the first edge that we spoke about, right? Uh, the, the high volume edge in the prior webinars. I maintain an IPO list. These are the young stocks in the market that I feel that can, you know, tend to run a lot more, provide a lot more beta. Uh, third is maintain a momentum or HDF watch list, which basically is, you know, stocks that have doubled have the potential to double again as long as the market remains in a solid uptrend. Uh, fourth, leadership themes and then universe, which is basically uh, the, the summation of the first four. Second, I formulate based on that a focus list. Uh, a focus list can be you know up to 10 names. I, I try to keep it less than 10 names. Uh, something that Nick Schmidt uh, recently said was, you know, if your focus list is more than 10 stocks, it's not a focus list, it's a watch list. I think that's very fair to say. Um, if you have too many stocks on your focus list, you don't, you won't really know what to focus on, uh, and your your attention to as to what you really want to invest or trade in in the markets will be scattered. And the more you do that, the less concentration you have in those positions, and the less concentration um, it bleeds into performance. But that's stage three type of talk at the end of the day. So then you know basically I'm building a weekly plan. That's kind of how I will operate for the week, right? Uh, and it has, you know, some of these elements associated with it. Uh, most of my work is done on the weekends. And then you take your weekly plan or what I do is take my weekly plan and then have, you know, 30, 45 minutes to an hour, you know, hey, today this happened. How does that change my weekly plan? Today this happened. So by, by the time you get to Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, you're ready for the next week's plan that you're uh, about to build. So this is what we will cover over the next few slides here. Uh, but I just wanted to give everybody an idea of, of, you know, something when you're six, seven, eight, nine years down the line, uh, you know, it, it, it could be something that looks like this. I'm not, the, the purpose of showing this is not to say you should have this today. I think it's too complex. You know, the more you simplify as stage one, two, the better it is. But then as you start doing this more professionally, it becomes a bigger source of your income. Then you add these elements just to have a full overall idea of what you're doing uh, in the markets. Next, I kind of broke it down. You know, what am I doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday? I know a lot of people ask uh, these type of questions. So uh, Friday, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to review every every trade that I took throughout the week. I do review my year to day performance. Again, it, it, at the end of the day, uh, we could say, hey, we don't want to look at our PL. We don't want to look at this. We want to focus on process. I think those things are good. Uh, but we also want to focus on how much we're losing. So I'm very keen on if I if I'm seeing a pullback, I need to reduce my position size. If I if I'm seeing if I'm five percent or ten percent from my all time high in my equity curve, I need to step it down in terms of how aggressive I am. So I'm very deliberate in doing some of that analysis because I'm trying to stop myself from myself at the end of the day. And you need to look at the numbers if you want to you know kind of achieve that. Uh, Saturdays, updating the key watch list, running the weekend. Uh, scans, reviewing the trader line report just to have a holistic picture. And then the, probably the most important part, Sunday, try to you know disconnect completely from the markets as much as possible because you want to come Monday morning to the desk and you're fresh, you're ready to go. You have some, you know, time away. And I, you know, a lot of traders, this is the most important part. Uh, this is the mechanical part, right? You review, analyze, run scans, et cetera. This is the most important part because if you're not disconnecting and you're saturating your brain sitting there Sunday at 11 p.m. thinking that you're going to hit some sort of pot of gold uh, at 11 p.m. and then waking up at um, you know six and you're if your mountain time market opens 7:30 you're doing yourself a disservice at the end of the day because your mind is not clear that means your decision making is going to be pretty bad and you're paid to make decisions in the market right so we want to have make sure that our mental side or our mental capital that we build should be, you know, even if I could take Saturdays off, I think I would perform bet better if I could do everything on Friday, but that's just not realistic um, at the moment. So um, that's a bit about, you know, what we will cover uh, in terms of the different elements. And I think now it's a good time to get in, uh, get into the key steps of building a trading routine. Richard, if you want to take this Yeah, one. sure. So we, we've said this kind of same list of steps a few different ways, but 
Um, I saw a question, you know, as a stage two trader, what's a recommendation as to what to have in our daily routine? That's pretty much what we'll cover at this point. Uh, you have to have some sort of market analysis where you're also trying to identify the groups and leaders, assessing how they're doing. Uh, you want to do some, some bare minimum analysis of your trades, your equity curve, your portfolio. Then you want to get into the, the new ideation for ideas where that's screening, building your focus list. And from that list, creating your trading plan. And then step number six, as Rai just emphasized, you know, there comes a point where going through 500 more stocks isn't going to, there's there's diminishing returns there, right? And you'd be much better off, you know, going out, hanging out with friends, going for a walk, going for a hike, uh, you know, uh, you know, enjoying your weekend, resetting your mind so that you're ready and focused and excited to trade. Because if you're just, you know, forcing yourself to, Go through every stock in the market um just just looking at so many stocks going through all those lists um you know you you get a little bit out of it and and you want to make sure you're excited to trade that next week by by stepping away taking a break i think that's really important so uh i, I think mean at the end of the day if you're miserable your your results are going to show that that you know and you don't want want to be uh you know forced into this because this is more of a passion profession, you know, professionally, if you're doing this, it's more passion that drives this and it keeps people going. When you go do a study, when you go, you know, go into the weeds of, Hey, uh, let's take put call ratio and go to a historical analysis. You are trying to better your game because mm -hmm. you want to do that. Right. Nobody's forcing you nine to five type of jobs are more so forcing you you're, you're kind of you feel like you're being forced but some people enjoy that some people excel at it because they're not miserable about it right? at the end of the day so the less the more you enjoy this the better it's going to be but you don't want to oversaturate where it's the only thing that you're doing and when it comes to that then your personal life is going to have you know ross is big on this when 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 your personal life is not you know at an all-time high your account your trading account won't be at an all-time high as well and it's just that's how it works so yep. I know. So I know, guess, yeah, let's get into step one, market sector group. Leadership. Yeah. Before that, I just want to add, you know, we, we've we talked with Stan Weinstein quite a bit and, and in his masterclass, he wanted to dedicate like a whole section to step number six, enjoying his life. You know, what does he do health wise to stay to in top shape? Uh, what does he like to do to de-stress, you know, step away from the markets? And that's somebody who's been doing this for decades and decades. So if you want advice about how to do this, and have longevity and, and a long career trading and compounding your account, you, you want to listen to people who have been doing this for decades and, and Stan's a great example from that. And he really emphasizes step, step number six. So yeah, just want to add that. All right. So step one, yep, let's move on. So market sector group and leadership analysis. So first, you know, this goes back to the previous webinar market analysis. Uh, where are we in the current market cycle? Are we in an uptrend? Are we in a downtrend? Are we just chopping around moving averages? There's not really a direction. Uh, how's the volatility? Uh, take everything you learned from the previous webinar and market cycles, which if you haven't watched, will be linked down below um, and package it and you know apply it to this slide because this is really, really important. Uh, getting this part right um, will set the stage for the rest of your routine. Um, but also, you know, we've talked about top down versus bottom up and we'll, we'll emphasize that a little bit more, you know, doing your screening process and going through all these stocks will further inform you about the health of the market and how things are doing. So this shouldn't just be limited to, you know, analysis of market indexes. There's a few things that come into play here, uh, but it's really important to, to get a sense of, you know, is the environment right for my style? Should I be pressing the gas? Should I be tapping the brakes? How should I be handling things? Um, so definitely refer back to the previous webinar on this. Uh, right? anything to add about you know this part of of your routine? I think you know in past webinars we said three three or four stocks move with the markets. Thirty seven percent of a stock's move is based on its industry group. Twelve percent on its sector. Right, um, and uh, I think the license to trade when the market is bad only is a license for stage three traders because they understand, they know the emotions, they they know how to navigate even a choppy situation. Uh, something that comes to mind is when Leif won in, I think, 2019, if I'm not mistaken, yep. it was a very choppy year, right? And 
he had a he was the top uh contender you know he came out on top at the end of 2019 and it you know in those type of years even in 2022 type of year uh stage one two traders blow up their accounts and that's just the the reality of it right and what is is allowing them to do that one they don't have a market cycle system like we discussed and second they're trading a market that's not um i would say uh, you know it, it's it's very hard even for the most experienced to do and they're trying to do it with um kind of you know the, the market flashing on and off in terms of the you know the count might be positive and then the trend changes and there's really nothing happening but it's chopping up traders you know left and right so have the market on your side the statistics also say the same thing uh, when you see mark let's say mark minervini go out and trade oil stocks in 2022 uh, when it's the only thing that's working uh, for a short span of time, and then he sells strength, and then he has a triple digit return. That's a goal after a twenty year journey, right? That's not a goal after a two year journey. You want to, you you can get there as quickly. He got there over a series, you know, of years, and that's you'll do the same. But you have to keep in mind if you don't survive, then you can't be doing, you know, the the long game is to have the market behind your back, and even the best of the best will admit, you know, their results get better 2x 3x better when the market's behind and when the sector is behind when the industry is behind so it's it's the most important yep moving on group sector theme analysis um this is something that is extremely important there's a lot of different ways to do this um you can take a look at just the overall sectors i've got an etf list which you can see here in in deep view the the screenshot here uh where i, I put in a bunch of group etfs um, this is sorted by price percent change the current week. So it's looking at, you know, very simply what areas of the market performed the best last week. And you can see clearly the themes that, you know, a lot of people noticed last week, we've got tech performing well, semiconductors rallying, um, the, the cyber names, the, you know, everything's standing out very clearly. And if you take a look at this every single day, every single week, you'll really spot that rotation clear as day. Uh, it's as simple as actually doing the work, which is as simple as creating a group of ETFs or sectors and then doing sorts on a daily basis by price percent change that day, uh, price percent change that week for a weekly routine. So you want to ask yourself, you know, what themes are active? What themes are strengthening? So what's, what's very early on that's still developing? It's maybe not the best theme right now, but it's up and coming. And then what themes are weakening as well? Because, you know, um, rotation happens things come and go um and you always want to take a look at you know what's on what's in an uptrend <clears throat> what's developing an uptrend what's an established uptrend and what's potentially falling off here to make way for uh, something new so if you really want to stay in tune with the market very simple way to do that create this etf list uh and this will confirm what you're seeing in individual stocks too because you'll you'll notice hey semiconductors did really well last week Oh, tech, d diving deeper into that theme. Wow, all these are setting up together. I should really be focused on that theme. So this is really how you identify leadership and what's acting well. So, uh, Ryan, you know you're you're great at this. Anything you'd like to add about you know identifying the the theme of 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 that cycle or of that period? Yeah, I, I see a lot of questions. You know, um, which ETFs should people follow and all of that stuff. Uh, it, you you can look at just go to etfdb.com um and build yourself a list from scratch as to what you feel are some of the groups and sectors that you should be tracking and then over time you could make it better the easy answer is i could just post a list and you have it at the end we'll do that that's not a problem we're, i'm not saying we're not going to do that but it, you will learn about hey uh semis smh is likely the best proxy from an etf perspective to track why because you looked at the holdings of smh and you see that it's a good one to have in your list right you want to justify all your inputs that bleeds into confidence so that when you see and sorted by price percent change or uh you know absolute strength score or any other metric you know exactly what you're trying you know looking at um as well um so I think having this is super important. It goes back to the same stat, stat we spoke about. 37% of the move is the industry group. And if you have, you know, right now, uh, something like cybersecurity names are doing pretty well. 
uh, I think in the markets. That's a group to keep track of. Uh, semis are doing uh, well, and then software is up and coming as well. Uh, some people never even looked at uranium stocks, right? Uh, that was a trend that was developing. I had the uranium ETF and I would see it, you know, week over week. It's setting up the markets pulling back. S and P's breaking fifty, Nasdaq breaking fifty. Uranium stocks are not. They're above their ten days. Why is that? That trade alone over the past September four or nine to the first week of October was the best trade you could take in the markets. How did Minervini you know these people that have routines and have this component as part of their routines? they might seem like they're geniuses to you and they, they know something that you don't know. It's not that. It's just that they have, they're tracking group, sector, and theme, and they have a process that allows them to sh just, it pushes the best names in those groups to the top and they're able to identify the theme. It's as simple as building this list at the end of the day. And you will be always, you know, gold miners are seeing rotation into it. How do you make that analysis? Well, GDX uh, could be moving up the chain, right? Or silver miners are all of a sudden seeing a bit. Now, how do you see that? You, you'll you have a silver miner ETF in this list and it's going to be you know near the top of the top. So this it's very, very va valuable to have this. Um, it will keep you in tune, very in tune with group sector theme analysis. It's a very powerful uh, concept. So yeah. And one thing to keep in mind here is, you know, it, it's not perfect. Um, these ETFs have different weightings based on market cap a lot of times. So you can throw in some equal weight uh, names in there, um, but really just it, keep it simple. If you notice a group standing out here, dive deeper, take a look at the, the components, you know, what stocks are acting well within that. And that will help drive you towards those, that leadership. Yep. Yep. So top down versus bottom up approach. Uh, so on the left, we've got kind of the flow for, for top down where you look at the market then you look at sectors, then you look at individual stocks. On the right, we've got the opposite where it's it's bottoms up. First, you know, doing screening, looking at the stocks themselves, that drives you towards the market, lead, uh, the, the leading groups, leading sectors, and then that informs you about the health of the market. Um, both have merits. I kind of do a mixture of both. And that's why I say here, why not both? Um, don't, you know, restrict yourself. Hey, I'm a I'm a bottoms up only trader. I can't I can't look at sector GFs. That that is no use to me. Uh, find what works for you. Um, and at the end of the day, what you want to do is make sure that you get those leading groups and leading stocks right. And however you get there is however you get there. So, uh, Ryan, I don't even know what what you kind of classify yourself as more. Uh, but I do, I, I do a mixture of both. Yeah, I, I I do both. I see benefits in both. I see. A lot of people, hey, if I don't have enough setups, why should I even look at the themes, et cetera? Very valid point, right? Uh, some, I, I think personally, stage one, two traders should, uh, the better way is to go the market sector stocks initially because you don't know which stocks will perform the best. One of the questions I saw in the chat earlier is my focus list is more than 10 names. How do I know which ones are best, right? Gauging a potential of a particular stock comes with experience of training your eye to see the chart technically or fundamentally or any which way, right? That's why this approach works later on in your career. Like when you're when you're going through and, and you see your routine say, this market's about to blow up, right? Or this market's about to break the 50. These statements that we see some of these successful traders make they see it right away, but it's hard as stage one, two traders to see it. So that's why I recommend this first, because you want to check each of those boxes. Hey, the market's with me, the sector's with me, and now I'm trading a stock within the, that particular sector industry group. I've stacked up my probabilities because honestly, stage one, two traders, they, you suck. We, you know, I... I, you know, you have to say I suck at this and I need the probabilities to align in my favor. And when that happens, I will move and graduate to another stage, right? It's all steps uh, to it. So that's why I recommend, you know, stage one, two, I, I strongly would back doing this. A lot of traders say, hey, um, this guy is, you know, Dan, Dan Zanger's doing this, Minervini's doing this. If I do this right away, then I will be like them. 
it doesn't work that way. It's more so the other way around. You have to look at the steps that they took and you take those to get to where they are. So yep. next is leadership analysis. Yep. So, you know, once you've identified the groups, you know, what are the, what are the leaders doing? What setups and themes are working? Um, some questions to ask yourself, you know, what are the top 10 names in the market right now? What are the potential leadership groups, right? I know you're always tracking those carefully and I am as well. Uh, what stocks would insert market wizard their own right now? What, how, what would they, what would he own? What would he uh, be interested in? Um, and then take a look at their charts and, you know, how are they performing? Cause that gives you a sense of, uh, you know, how's that stock performing? How's that group performing? All of that. And it's kind of the qualitative aspects of market analysis. You can take a look at the indexes. You can say, Hey, we had a follow through day. Uh, we broke down today. We broke below the 50, but, uh, taking a look at the stocks themselves and the leaders, um, you know, Ross always says, watch the leaders, watch the leaders. That adds a whole new dimension to your market awareness where um, you, you almost get uh, to take a look, you know, a few days ahead of what the market indexes are doing by analyzing the leaders. So uh, this is super important. And how do you find the leaders? Kind of what we've been saying, find find the strongest groups, find the strongest stocks within them and uh, and take a look at their relative strength rating, which ones are holding up the best, which ones are above moving averages when the market is pulling in, holding up the best when the markets are down on that day. All those different bits and pieces can help you find uh, those leaders. And it also forces you to allocate your portfolio in a way that I, I try to force myself. Like if I say, hey, semis are leading, do I own a semi? Right. Do I do I actually go and buy NVIDIA in May and run it up to September? Because in May, uh semis were one of the the potential leadership groups, right? As market firm the, the markets firmed up. Or um cybersecurity names now uh could be a potential potential leadership group. And if that analysis you do that, you you want to force yourself to then own those names in your portfolio as well, right? So that's why I try to deliberately track on my end. I, I try to say, hey, what are the top three groups that I could write down on paper? And am I basically positioned in one of those three? And what my what is my portfolio allocation with respect to what I'm calling leadership at the end of the day, right? That's, again, going to yield you the best returns because you're deliberately positioning in, in uh, a group that you've identified that you feel is going to outperform every other group um, in the markets as well. So uh, I bit of it is, you know, a deliberate practice to make sure you actually own them, not just you're tracking, hey, uranium stocks are doing well, oil names are doing well, but you don't really own any of them. You're just kind of watching... Uh, on the sidelines. So you want to make that a point when you go out, put positions in, um, you know, press that buy button to make sure that your your portfolio allocation is in line with leadership. Yep. So getting into step two here, um, portfolio trade uh, equity curve analysis. This is definitely really important here. So yeah, uh, we've we've covered this previously, but um, just re-emphasizing because really important. You know, chart your equity curve. Are you in an uptrend right now? Are you making higher highs, higher lows, or are you pulling back and you're in a drawdown? How high are you? How far off highs are you? Um, as Ryan mentioned, and we we made the slides independently here. Ranking grade your current positions. Um, this is something that I picked up from Mike Webster, where you want to take a look at you know what's the strongest in your portfolio, what's the weakest. And that helps you because if the market doesn't got, does go into a correction, you want to cut the weakest stocks first. So having that in mind, what's my strongest stock? What's my best stock? What's my worst stock? Uh, just makes that process so much easier um, and uh, more pain free. So yeah, you always want to be taking a look at your actual positions, your equity curve, and seeing how they're performing. And you know, if they're not performing, you know, you don't have to own anything. You know, um, managers in baseball want to play their best stars. Uh, but they have to play somebody as as a portfolio manager of your accounts. You've got the luxury of benching every single one of your stars if they're not performing. So, um, yeah, ma make use of that tool. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm a big advocate of this. Um, you want to see your results. You want to see what you own. 
you want to see if the market's in an uptrend and your portfolio is in a downtrend, you own the wrong stocks. It's just as simple as that, right? Um, a lot of uh, us, as when we start out, we start blaming the markets and we go through that whole cycle, right? And then we learn that we shouldn't blame the markets. So it kind of stops you from that aspect as well. And then also, yeah, Mike Webster's point on, you know, rank and grade, grade your positions is one of the, the best things that um, I've implemented when I'm reviewing my portfolio uh, and also ranking them, right? Hey, if tomorrow the, the NASDAQ's down 2%, what are you getting rid of, right? Which stocks are you going to get rid of? Which ones are your weakest ones? You know that these ones are not performing. They're not working for you and you're working hard to keep them. At the end of the day, you don't want to be in that situation, right? Especially when the market's uptrending too. So uh, third is post analysis. So Richard, go ahead. Yeah. So of, of the trades you took that week, uh, you want to take a look at them, put them on the chart. I think that's, a you know, you don't just want to look at, you know, oh, I made 5% on this position. Oh, I, I made 2%. Oh, I lost 3%. Plot them on the chart and then go back with, with a really objective lens almost take yourself out of it. Like you didn't make the trade, um, you know, act as if Rye gave me a trade he did and, and asked me to grade it. And then, oh, you're, you're muted, Rye. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you try to be as objective as possible. Grade based on your process. Uh, remember that you made decisions in the moment um, with the knowledge you had available. Everything's easy in hindsight. Oh, I should have held, you know, whatever. Uh, keep all that perspective in mind. Up. And um, really take a look at did that did I make the correct decision in that moment of time? Um, and one important thing to remember here when you're grading your your trades, and we've got a whole webinar on this, is it's not just about the end result. Yeah, it's great if you made twenty percent on a position, but you could have made twenty percent uh, twenty percent on a position by buying the day before earnings, and it it luckily gapped up. If it gapped down. You know, that was a loss is it, you know, you, you made a bad decision at the end of the day. So always think about process over really the performance, especially as a stage one and two trader, and just try to incrementally improve by studying yourself, studying your trades, charting them up. Um, and then you've got all these great case studies to refer back to. If you've got 50 examples of buying from a VCP pivot breakout, uh, then when you come up with um, a new idea that matches this template, you, you've got a blueprint to follow. So this is a really great exercise that will really, really make the difference in your portfolio. Um, and if you don't do it, you're just kind of doing yourself a disservice. There's a reason that um, all the professional athletes watch game tape, even if they lost by, you know, in, in football, you know, 60 to zero or whatever, they're going to watch that and identify areas that they can improve. I, I Areas that they did well in, they want to do more of that. Uh, but you don't know the truth unless you actually go out and analyze. So um, this is also super helpful in terms of market awareness. Again, um, it gives you feedback on your trades. If in, in a week you took five trades um, and the first was a loss and then you did four straight wins, hey, the, mar the market or at least your style is improving. Um, but if you had two wins and then loss, 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 that's a sign to, hey, take your take your foot off the accelerator a little bit, tap the brakes, lower your position size a little bit, and uh, be aware that your style or at least, um, you know, at least for the moment isn't quite acting very well. So yeah, post analysis, super helpful, not only improving yourself as a trader, uh, but keeping you aware and in tune with the market as well, which is a huge part of our screening and, and routine process. Brian, anything to add on post analysis? No, I think... Uh... You know, you should consistently do it. Um, uh, the point being, you know, I know some folks that don't do it anymore because they've 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 graduated kind of past that stage where twenty five years in, thirty years in, they know how to, you know, they know how they're performing. Um, it, it's a, I think it's important to keep those stats, like just like any, uh, if you have, if you own a small business at the end of the day and you don't know its stats you're kind of just flying blind at that point and it introduces one randomness as to what you're doing day to day and then randomness is what basically kills traders right swing traders position traders and investors because there's no consistency in what they're doing and then a lack of consistency just you get bad 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 results right um 
The second point I do want to emphasize is it's process over profits. Initially, it's process over profits and not just initially, just forever. It's process over profits um, because it it sounds corny. It sounds what everybody says that, you know, the same thing. Um, you're not saying anything new, but it is what it is at the end of the day. If you follow a set, you know, routine and you make post analysis, you know, you say, hey, this stock got on my radar on this date. How can I improve that process to maybe uh, find it a little bit earlier, right? And you backtrack um, those steps to make your trading a little bit better as time goes on, right? Um, and it's it's the same thing. So if you focus on that and you improve your processes, like something we're learning on the deep you side, it's nothing to do with trading, but as we improve our internal processes slowly, we're seeing better results in terms of how we roll out features. Completely unrelated to trading in our talk today, but again, it's the focus on, we improve our processes, we see better results, it carries over to anything that you do um, in, in life. So you want to do the same in your trading. You know, um, so the one improvement that I made recently was I would notice stocks that would get tight near a low of the base, right? Uh, get directional, be it to the, the upside or the downside. So now, you know, with Richard's magic of RMV, that's something that I want to consistently look at and is screen for in the market. So I'm making that as a small tweak to my current process where something like PLTR recently, where it pulled back in, it had three tight days in a row relative to how it traded before in the last 20 sessions or 15 sessions or 25 sessions. So now I'm seeing, you know, i made that observation and now I'm making that part of my process to see, you know, I, I can anticipate some sort of directional movement from these tight areas visually. So making that part of my weekend routine as well, right? And you add and subtract as you go over time. And as you do post analysis, right? Uh, I'm a I'm a day and a dollar late on a particular name. I hear that excuse all the time, right? It's very easy to say, hey, I could have bought this, you know, uh, this stock is now at uh, 27. I, it should have been on my radar at 25. Well, stop yourself right there and then and say, how do I improve my process to actually, you know, actually have it on my watch list on this day, it, 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 you know, in the future, anticipate this movement so that you can gradually make that, you know, uh, improvement in your routines, and that will show in your results. So it, it's a long game, right? Um, the third one, feedback is so important. Like, you'll have five losses in a row, and if you keep your position sizing the same, like we spoke about in previous webinars, your results are going to get dramatically worse and fast. You'll give away all your gains. You'll have a downward trending equity curve. That's stage one, two, again, at the end of the day. So if you're, you know, you're the feedback that you get from your trades is the best feedback. And I saw someone say something a little better in the chat with uh, with respect to uh, what Minervini says or how he says it, but that's really the truth is in your trades at the end of the day, right? So you, you need to look at them. Let's get into step three, screening. Richard, do we have any questions or are we answering questions today? Yeah, or? I've been answering questions. Uh, one thing I do want to bring up, uh, KS asked a really good question. How do you rank stocks? Uh, is it purely quantitative, like percentage from entry point or their qualitative sides as well, i.e. group strength? Um, I think the, the first layer is that quantitative, you know, from your buy point, how are you performing on that name? Uh, but then I definitely do take into account, you know, is it, is it do i consider it a leader i'll give it more of a benefit of a doubt um is it in a theme that's still strong or is that theme kind of tailing off a little bit is it is it beginning is it emerging all of that so number one for me and i don't know what it is for you right exactly but number one for me is performance and then just like i'm if i'm assessing a new entry point on a stock a new opportunity I'm looking at the technical aspects as well as the fundamental aspects and trying to judge the quality of a stock. Um, it, it's tough to do, but you if, if you set up a set of conditions that you look for, um, you know, uh, you can develop a process for yourself. But Ryan, how do you how do you kind of rank your stocks? I I break them in, in terms of something that I can own for three to six to nine months, something like an Uber, very liquid, NVIDIA, very, very liquid, right? You could buy a whole bunch of it 
super quickly. And you can have, you know, semis are going to lead from May. I can have a position in NVIDIA and continuously build that position as it goes, right? Whereas if we if we take a look at NVIDIA, let's say compare it with the CVNA. For my style of trading, some people, CVNA could be your leadership stock because you're a purely momentum day trader type of person and you just want the biggest uh, stuff that's just ripping to the upside. That's a style that people trade and it's fair. For them, CVNA might be a leader because it performs the best. It's it's moved up 500% in less than uh, three months, right? That's perfectly fine. For me, you know, something like an Uber NVIDIA is very different from something like a CVNA. So if I were to trade those, I would build, you know, I rank them higher. I give them more benefit of doubt as to if an NVIDIA comes back into the 21 day, uh, have I sold up, sold enough into strength to continue holding and let this new consolidation build? If it does, then I can, you know, continuously build uh, back my position or whatever I sold into that. So I try to segment them completely my momentum side is very different from my uh, i would say position trading investing whatever you want to call it side um and that's how i treat my stocks at the end of the day so um yep cool all right Any, I think we'll... yep we can keep going so mm -hmm. screening Oops. yeah anyway. so so for me um i think there's kind of two main objectives of screening uh, kind of what we've already talked about. First, as you go through screen results, you'll get a better sense of the market health. You'll get continued market analysis of here uh, using using screens and going through results, and you'll develop that situational awareness about, hey, you know, this environment is developing. It's really improving a lot. Oh, it's really deteriorating. There's a lot of less stocks that are showing up on my screens. You'll, you'll notice those nuances if you do this consistently, run the same screens every day, every week. Um, the second half of it is what probably most people focus on. Let me just find the next stock to trade. But I think I, I put number one as number one for, for a reason, because that's almost more important than the trade ideation part of it. But obviously with screening, we do want to set up screens um, and processes that help us find uh, stocks that match the blueprint of prior winners, um, whatever that means to you, we, we've talked a lot about different setups, entry tactics, all of that. Uh, but for me, these are kind of the two main objectives of screening. Uh, anything to add on this slide, Rye? No, I think it, it, it gives you, um, it, it's more tactical in what you're doing, right? So you have a feel for the market, step one, you have the feel for the group, step two. Now you want to really get into the individual names that you can potentially own. And that's really what screening is about, right? Yeah. Um, so let's say I say cybersecurity is uh, doing really well in my sector analysis. I say that the queues had a follow through day um, or are now in a positive market cycle count as of Friday, right? Those two things have happened the past week where uh, what what are we, October 7th today, uh, 2023, those things have happened as of Friday. Now I want to go into those groups and kind of, you know, dive a little bit deep into individual names. So is a, you know, at the end of the day, what you want to get to is, is a crowd, you know, CRWD better than Zscaler uh, right now, or uh, technically what stocks you feel, you know, what groups you feel are potential leadership groups and does your portfolio reflect some of the individual names that are in those potential leadership groups? So this is really what screening is about, is to, to dig you know, deeper into individual uh, names. Yep. So I've kind of separated out uh, screens into two different categories. First is a general screen. The other version is a specialist screen. Um, I've got some icons here. First is, is, a, is a wide net for the general screen. Uh, and then the specialist screen, you, you, you're much more precise. You're using a scalpel to find those ideas. So with general screen, screens, we're casting a wide net. We've got some minimum criteria that we've added to the screen that you know cuts out a lot of uh, the stocks that we do, don't want to see, whether that means it has to be in an uptrend, it has to be above a liquidity level. You set this minimum criteria uh, to make sure you eliminate most of, of what doesn't apply. Um, general screens really give you a better sense of groups developing because you kind of see more of the market a little bit. Um, and when I go through, for instance, the DFU universe screen, which is kind of my main general screen in DFU, 
I kind of short my relative strength. I ha always have the industry column as one of my main ones. So, you know, uh, if I notice this stock is acting well, it's in this industry group. Hey, I'm noticing a lot of that industry pop up. A lot of these stocks are setting up nicely. That's how you find and identify a rotation. So it's really helpful to always keep the industry in mind um, as you're going through general screens and a lot of different stocks. Then on the flip side, we've got specialist screens and we'll give examples of, of each of these categories. Uh, the specialist screens are is much more of a focused search for a very particular pattern or opportunity type. Um, again, based on historical um, examples, it's very strict criteria versus minimum criteria with a general screen. And it can also be and should be situation dependent uh, and depend. Maybe this depends on the market cycle. If we're early on in the cycle, you want to focus more on uh, early stage two breakouts or gap ups on earnings. Um, if you're seeing, you know, if we're in the market cycle at a point where there's a lot of pullbacks in the leadership, you're screening more for stocks that are right around that 21 EMA around the 50 SMA. So this can be also kind of very entry tactic or entry setup focus. Uh, anything to add on this, Rai, uh, general screens versus specialist screens? No, I think uh, a, a few things uh, for traders is, you know, as you go through in, in the, the general screens, um, you will kind of cross off, hey, uh, commodities are not for me, or uh, the gold trade is not for me. It's a little tough. Or um, when I uh, get into leveraged ETFs, I need to exclude those from my screening. So those things will happen as you trade them. Um, you trade oil and then you get frustrated and you get rid of it. Or maybe you, you enjoy that and you can anticipate news and that's your natural talent, right? That you want to exploit then those things become part of it or don't. So that's kind of the general side and how I see it. Um, some traders um, say that, you know, stock, I only trade stocks above 20 because their experience with stocks below 20 hasn't been a pleasant one, right? So that could be a general net or um, dollar liquidity criteria, right? Um, I want to trade stocks that are on a 50-day average basis, trade $20 million um, in a day or more. So that could be something. Those those are things that you will pick up as you go uh, and add to your general screen criteria or your base criteria of how you see the markets. Um, one thing I would discourage is to not take any word anyone's word for it, even though you may value their opinion. That's perfectly fine. But go out and uh, experience it for yourself. I think that's a that's super powerful to go in and, uh, you know, try to uh, go through and, and learn the, the, the oil market. It's just, you know, it builds up your general, you know, uh, experience and you get to say for yourself, Hey, I tried this. It didn't work. I tried this. It didn't work. I tried. The, the more you do that, the better trader you will be in, in a couple of years from now, uh, in terms of specialist screens, the way I use them, I, I have very specific ones. You know, I just want to see the highest volume gap ups that ex happened in the market today. And that's a daily screen that I run. And it gives me those stocks, then I can put them in, into my watch list, right? Uh, very special related to your edge in the markets. Or I can scan for uh, relative strength, right? Uh, market is down 2%. Show me stocks that are uh, positive on the day. A form of relative strength, right? That's tactical specialist screening depending on the situation. Um, uh, show me inside days when the market has an outside day to the downside. Another tactical, you know, uh, screen that shows you or gives you information as to what's holding uh, up well. And then, you know, much of the daily analysis that you will do if you base it on your screens is that stocks sector market approach, right? Uh, whereas your weekend can be based on uh, market sector and stocks approach. So that way, that's why I say, that's why Richard says we do both, right? Depending on the situation, we do both and we try to formulate a bigger picture of the market. So you you guys will be doing both in your trading and investing career, career like as you go through and build some, you know, general criteria that your general screening and specialist uh, screens as well as you figure out your style. So here is a 
you know, a universe type of scan. I, I believe this is the DP universe, right? So. Yeah. So this is kind of my main um, general screen that I run. This is a preset in deep view um, and it, it's looking for minimum liquidity trend, industry group strength, RS scores, pretty strong. Uh, and it's got an emphasis on recent performance, you know, one month, three month performance. Um, this is my go-to if I, if I had to run only one screen, you know, uh, I think, uh, was it Ross who asked that? I, I forget who asked that, but, um, you know, this would be the one that I would run and this would be my, the only one that I would want to consider. It does a great job of capturing the leaders. Uh, you can go through this, identify rotation, all of that. Um, and, uh, it makes use of the and or filter logic in deep view as well. So this is a great, you know, simple screen to run. It looks, you know, you've got at least ten dollars uh, in order to show up on the screen, and uh, it's a great place to get started if if you're using Deep View. Um, and typically, it returns about three hundred to four hundred stocks. And I kind of watch that number a little bit. Uh, if it's you know dipping down, it means a lot more stocks are in downtrends. Uh, if it's really expanding, getting above four hundred, you know, a lot of stocks are trending and doing well and are above those moving averages. So that's also another helpful component of of going through these general screens is seeing, you know, just in general, how many stocks are coming through my very basic criteria. Um, that that's pretty important. Perfect. There's another one. Yeah. Liquid leaders this is for people who really try to focus on those really liquid names. This is looking for at least a hundred million in terms of average dollar volume over the past 20 days. Uh, it's over $20 and it's gotta be, uh, pretty strong RS score wise or AS score wise in the past one month uh, in the top 7%, uh, past three months, top 13%. So if you're just focusing on those liquid institutional quality names, uh, this is a really good and very simple uh, screen to start with. And again, uh, this is pretty general. Uh, it's only showing 59 results right now, which is, you know, it tells you a little bit about the market. Um, but you know, in general, this can have up to about eighty names uh, when st stuff are really in established trends. Uh, then we've got uh, Christian Kualamagi's uh, screens in the DFU platform. This is uh, one of his go-to uh, screens, and we've got variations for both one month, three month, and six month. It's looking for minimum liquidity. Make sure that the stock has a high enough ADR; it actually can make moves. And just looking for the top 2% of stocks over that period, whether that's one month, three month, or six month basis, definitely a really good screen to go to, to, to find those high momentum names. And lastly, we've got Minervini's trend template in there in deep view. Uh, th this matches the, the trend criteria that he talks about in his books. Uh, it's looking for a, a minimum move off lows above the 200 day for a certain period. And uh, it's looking basically for stocks in that minimum trend that he looks for. And yeah, we've got variations for one month to spot those early turns uh, all the way up to five months for more established uptrends. So definitely a really good uh, general screen as well. I think of the ones we've gone through, the Minervini, Minervini trend template and DV universe are kind of the widest look uh, at the market. All right, so specialist screens. Uh, I made a quick one at HV Edges. Uh, Ryan, I know you've got your variations here, uh, but this is just looking for um, stocks with a minimum liquidity over high and that matches the highest volume edge, whether that's ever one year or since IPO. You can definitely add a daily closing range um, requirement to this, a gap up range, uh, but this is just kind of casting a wide net and looking for these type of names. Uh, then here's a, a special screen. I think we mentioned this before. This is looking for really strong stocks with high IR, RS scores, our AS scores here. And then it's got to be within a few percent of that 21 EMA. So it's looking for stocks that have already made a nice move that can move. And then it's pulled back now to that 21 EMA. So I really like the screen. It's one of my go-to ones uh, that I run whenever we've got a short-term pullback in the market. That's when I bring out the specialist screen and take a look at uh, how, you know, what leaders are pretty close to that 21 EMA, which ones are forming ranges near that area. Uh, triple digit growth. This is my, uh, the next Lavongo finder. Um, we're basically looking for uh, top tier recent fundamental growth, whether that's earnings growth or sales growth above 100% the most recent quarter. 
Um, obviously, you know, you could even tailor this and look for future growth. We've got so many estimates in DFU as well. Uh, but this is a great simple screen that's that's looking for a more fundamental focused setup. So it doesn't just have to be a technical setup. You can also look at the fundamentals as well, uh, depending on your style, whether um, you're more technical focused or you like to consider the, the fundamental growth as well. All right, so be before I move on, uh, Rai, any anything else on specialist screens that uh, you like to run or, or that people should keep in mind as as they're developing their own and, and maybe using the, the presets in DFU? Because a lot of these are uh, presets and available to anybody. So I would say whatever you define as your edge should have at least a, uh, a specialist screen associated with it, right? Or uh, let's say you're looking for triple inside days, uh, for example, Three inside days or uh, the narrow range seven day scan, right? NR7 scan, um, which is, you know, tightness on a, on a chart. Any of that qualifies as specialist screen. And what we covered in prior webinars, like edges and entry tactics, some of your scans should align with that, right? Uh, some of your general scans will be, you know, how's the market doing? So one that Ross runs every day is up on volume, gives him a good gauge of how many stocks are on that list. He reviews that list, allows him to find some themes uh, throughout the week that might be emerging or some sort of rotation that might be happening in the market. So always what, what we're doing is we uh, build each of the frameworks and this being framework six, they're all tied to each other, right? So do that, make sure that your screens are tied to, to whatever you classify as an edge or an entry tactic. And this will allow your system that you're building to, to evolve, so. All right, so building your universe list. So what you wanna do once you have your set of general and specialist screens that's applicable to the current environment is you wanna combine the results of those different lists or go through the results individually and basically flag and highlight and add to a watch list any stocks that are trending particular strong or uh, developing setup so strength could mean multiple gap ups on volume a strong gap up on earnings significant breakout any stocks that you want to keep tabs on and could potentially within the next few weeks few months uh, you know be actionable based on your setup um, you want to add those to your universe list. So you want to basically track these names and have this kind of be your overall growth watch list. That's kind of uh, the biggest filter that you have um, outside of your general and specialist screen. So, you know, the, the top tier are all the stocks that come through your general and specialist screens. And then one layer down uh, is this universe list that then you'll go ahead and use to build your focus list um, and actually find stocks to trade. So anything you want to add on, on the universe list and how you go about it, Rye? No, I think uh, just something that I do is I I review my universe throughout the day. Um, that's something that gives me an idea of what the market's doing today. So when the market's open, uh, I tend to review my universe just to see, you know, based on what, what if I'm a bullish or up, you know, I trade the best when stocks are an uptrend. Um, and we, we're seeing that my, my universe is not performing as well, then my anticipation skills will say, we're about to see a pullback, even though the indexes might look great. Right. So that's another way to you, you kind of look at your universe for key information as to, to what is happening. Um, so build, you know, having those specialist screens and your general screens will again allow you on a day-to-day -day basis give you a good idea and then on the weekends you could take a look at the markets and the groups and everything um to give you a, a holistic picture so uh, those two things play again play off of each other for you to have a really good idea of what uh, the market is doing so yep so from now you've got your universe set. So you've got your, your list of strong, strong stocks. And now the trick is to go from that larger list and narrow it down further to around 10 names that are potentially actionable that next week. So let's dive in here to step four. So what you want to do is think about, you know, what 
which of these stocks is potentially actionable from a proper setup uh, within the next week or so, within the next few days. And you want to think about which of these stocks has the top combination of both fundamentals and technicals. You can weight that depending on your system. Um, you want to think about when with each of these stocks, how many edges are showing, what entry tactics would you use, what entry setup would you use. And this is a really key point at the end. Um, it, and this is kind of for me personally, but I think it applies especially for people starting out. You, it, the stock should be set up on both a weekly chart and daily chart on, on both these time frames. Um, if you're just looking for an entry tactic out of nowhere, a stock that's already extended, it's already made a huge move from a base, that's not really a stock that should be on your focus list. You can track that because it's had a powerful move. And if it forms another base, consolidates enough, then it could be another good setup. But uh, you always want to think about what is the potential of the stock? What could it realistically do from my buy point? Rye, I think you just kind of said this offhand a few months ago. You know, you always think about could the stock realistically double from here based on what you've studied in the past? And I think that's a great, you know, um, focusing question to ask yourself from this setup, could the stock realistically double when the market is in an uptrend? Um, if it doesn't, you know, satisfy that criteria, there's likely a better opportunity out there. Uh, you also want to go back to your leadership list here and your, and your themes that you've noticed uh, those stocks and those lists, if they're set up should be prioritized and uh, find its way on your focus list. Cause we want to be focused on the best names, those leadership quality names. So, um, yeah, I think the key point is should be set up on a weekly chart and daily chart. Think about how many edges and uh, the stock is showing, what entry tactics you would you would use. It should be actionable within the next week or two. Uh, right? Anything that you really think about when you're building your your focus list? I yeah. So there could be you know uh, I saw a few questions earlier on how do you reduce the number of names? How do you gauge potential of you know the ten fifteen that you narrow down as the these are the best investment opportunities. How, how do you do that? So one is, um, you know, are there multiple edges on that single name? So if I see relative strength with with a high volume edge uh, being present at the same time, then I will double down on that type of name. So what comes to mind is VRT, ELF type of names, right? Uh, NVIDIA, uh, PLTR recently where it went from 10 to, uh, 10 to 20. So some of these names, when they exhibit the high volume edge and then subsequently show relative strength at the same time, you're seeing multiple forces that you feel give you an edge in the market to align. Those will go to the top of the top, right? Whereas if a name that shows maybe one of the three edges that you see in the markets, then obviously you have to position size that accordingly and you have to weight it accordingly as well. Uh, with respect to the last point of the weekly chart aligning with daily is very important. This is something that Oliver Kell does and kind of uh, talked about in the uh, swing trading masterclass was he's always taken a look at the weekly has to align for him to trade the daily at the end of the day. So uh, that again, he, that's how he puts his probabilities or stacks up his probabilities in his favor, right? Without that, he feels when he operates just based on the daily with no weekly trend, his outcome or what he's seeing uh, in his results is not favorable. So he tends to sway towards, a, you know, that type of style. So whatever it is, um, you know, we can get into maybe in, in future webinars or uh, as the, you know, how exactly do you, quantitatively you could do it, but there's also at the end of the day, you know, when you say, Hey, I, th I feel like this name should double uh, that comes from doing, you know, uh, that's seat time, that's experience, that's studying different, you know, your edge properly having a playbook and saying, I, I remember these 10 names off the top of my head that looked like this. And I feel like this name is about to do the same. Right. Uh, when we talk about Arlo, right. Going from five to the, where it is right now above 10 um it looked exactly like another stock at the end of ahr right uh and that type of analysis is not just gonna uh come overnight it will come with time right and then it you know i want to concentrate on this name because it reminds me of this other name or i want to concentrate on this because when i did a study of this this particular characteristic these are how these names perform. All of that comes from studying the markets and that becomes part of how you won't 
rate or rank names on your focus list or names you feel are worthy of your attention. Whereas an, an NVIDIA is worthy of my attention because I've seen this before in, you know, liquid names, a name that has built a base for six to eight months and is now acting really, really well or has a new catalyst, right? Uh, a lot of people tend to gravitate towards, you know, cannabis had a time where it worked really well. AI now, it's, you know, in recent times is, is you know, if you have AI, you're moving to the upside type of stuff. So um, that also will be, you know, become part of your analysis over a span of time. Um, I know people that look at uh, Rivian looks technically, it looks really great. And if you ask a fundamental guy, they're losing $33,000 per car that they sell. They would never buy it regardless of what the chart looks like because their edge is fundamental. They know what you know what what to look for, and Rivian doesn't make it to the top of their list because they are fundamental traders. They rank based on different metrics, right? And as technical traders, if you're a technical and you rank certain you know things at the top, those names will have to rise. They will get more of your attention. They will get more of your portfolio size, and then based on your results, you can tweak that formula and and continue forward. So, um, one one question people might be wondering is. Uh, and I know I, people have asked this previously, you know, how do I get to 10 names? How do I, you know, they may be able to get to 30 names, but how do you get to that last bit? Uh, what I would say is one simply, is it a leader? I already mentioned that, you know, if it is, then it should be hop on the list <clears throat> Two, you know, is it a potential leadership? Is it part of a potential leadership group? That's extremely important. And then looking at the technicals, are there huge signs of accumulation, not just signs of accumulation, but huge signs, the prior uptrend, there's gap ups, there's huge volume coming in. Then during the base, it's, you know, volume and volatility are contracting together. The up days are on higher volume than down days. And it's clear, it's picturesque, it's textbook. Uh, those are the type of names that should be on your focus list, not just some, you know, C minus type stock. Restrict yourself to A plus trades. Uh, focus on those um, and just see what performance you can get out of those. Be very, very restrictive. You should be focusing on the 0.001% of stocks um, available to you. Uh, and those are the only ones worthy of making up wait to make it on your weekly focus list. Um, yeah, I, I just want to add that because people, I, I get asked that quite a bit. How, how do you narrow it down to 10 days? It's really hard to narrow it down to 10 days. Be really restrictive. You know, if you're more fundamental focused, the stock has to have EPS growth of 25% last quarter. It has to have estimates next quarter of 30%. Um, you know, don't, don't weaken your criteria to try to open things up uh, and try to get everything. Focus, focus, focus. That's the whole point of this list. And also, you're, you're destined to miss. Here. Yeah. If you have a list of uh, six to eight names and you feel like you pick stock A and and uh, stock B outperforms, they're part of the same group. That's going to happen. You know, that will happen. Your analysis could be, you, you You did everything perfectly. You checked all the boxes, but it just so happens that the name that you chose and you felt would perform, outperform is an outperform. And that's the reality of trading. It's not to be perfect. It's to be, you know, have a, be in the same ballpark as the, where a winner might be. And then some of it is luck. Some of it, you know, you get a gap up out of nowhere. It gets upgraded out of nowhere. That's those things will happen. The the more that you uh, work hard and see, you know, do the same things again and again, and see those repetitive patterns, luck will be naturally on your side, right? Or you do everything correctly and you get hit with a gap down that other side will also happen at the end of the day. So um, one other thing I did want to add was uh, it, I find myself when, when I started kind of in the same situation, it was very hard for me to narrow things down because I felt I would miss certain names and the whole, my whole objective was I don't want to miss a name. Right. Um, so coming to the, you know, the, just knowing that I am going to miss them, but, what what do I learn after I miss them is a lot more important to me still today and will be forever. You talk to Ross, same thing, you know, three decades in, 35 years into this, uh, 
what you learn from what you miss in the markets is much more important than being very negative after you miss something, right? So that's where post analysis comes into play, where you go and, hey, it was on my radar. It didn't make my top five. And it was one of the best performing winners. What what did I do after the fact? So concentrate on that side more than, hey, I missed it. Well, we'll try again. And you're still the, your process is still the same. Your results are still going to be the same. Whereas the other thought process is, hey, I missed it. How can I tweak my process a little bit to make it better? So then the next time I run through my daily routine or weekend routine, my results are going to be incrementally a little bit better, right? So that with that kind of philosophy or approach, you will you will get better with time. Uh, and you won't, I look forward to like just completely, you know, I, we're destined to, met, if I hit, again, I said this and it was one of the comments was if, if uh, I have 30%, you know, uh, win rate, why don't I just guess? <laughs> I would have a better <laughs> I would have a better time guessing in the markets than uh, with that win rate. So it, it goes back to that point where you want to make sure you you just you're consistently you're consistent with your inputs. So you can see your outputs, then you analyze your outputs, and then you improve your inputs, and you just keep going, you keep going, you keep going. So yeah, something um, to to help you. Uh with that to, to narrow it down. Maybe you can get down to 30 names. Keep keep a wider list, keep that wider list and then restrict it somehow. Uh, but then at the end of the week, go back to that wider list, sort by weekly performance and go through those names and try to note, oh, this one, this one had this characteristic. That's why I performed well. Oh, all these ones that had really good characteristics were part of this group. And you'll start to tweak and notice, you, you know, develop your process more. So it's a lot easier to get the, to those 10 names that will perform well. Um, it, that's that's kind of the art and, and just doing this more and more and doing your routines, you know, consistently is going to help you make that process so much faster. Going from a universe list to a wider list to that focus list, it'll be very streamlined and you'll have a clear path. But you have to build, you have to build in those processes before you can get there. What, what another easy way as you were talking about that is look at your universe list performance week to week. It's just like an aggregate number. It will give you a good, hey, am I even in the right, I'm, am I even looking at the right stocks? Or look at the performance of your focus list, right? You could say, I have five names or I have 10 names on my focus list. How did your focus list perform with respect? To, you could do an equal weighting. doesn't matter, right? Do an equal weighting and you'll clearly know, am I on the right track? If you're on the right track, you're, you're ways ahead of everybody else already at that point. Then it's a, it's a matter of, you know, then the, it's, it's the granularities of, you know, how do you really concentrate and get that 10 to five and what you notice is the difference, right? So those could be some, some, some of the things and maybe even uh, Richard, I'm thinking like in the deep view module, we have something like that where you, you, you could send you a weekly report on one of your watch lists, you know, a performance report that way you, you get an idea and it will allow you to improve week to week. Right. Uh, I'm not looking at the right stocks. I need to improve my process. I am looking at the right stocks. Now it's about my execution. It will give you a very clear signal what the what the issue is at the end of the day. Yep. And you can also very simply, you know, uh, outside of your universe, look at what stocks perform best on a quarterly basis that meet certain minimum criteria. Obviously, there's going to be tiny stocks that, you know, go crazy. But um, that's another way to think about studying winners and incorporating what you're noticing that's consistent in those winners into your process. Um, one of my one of my mentor yeah. uh, mentors uh, used to look at uh, weekly volume being above one billion as a sign, and ran a study based on that, and saw that over the next quarter, the next you know two quarters, three quarters, and four, those stocks would perform really, really well. And that became one of his wider net screens, right? Uh, his, his, you know, thing, a thing that he would look at because he saw stocks that would do that perform really well. And coincidentally, PLTR was one of them. When it went from 10 to 20, the, the week that it traded on that big gap, that weekly volume was right about 1 billion. So 
it just those things, right? You'll notice them and, and you'll make them part of your process and you'll get better. So perfect. So I think we could get the update watch list. This is kind of turned into like a podcast at this point. <laughs> I, I like though. I'm, I'm having a good time. So yeah. So so this is, you know, at the end of your process, uh, you're gonna have your focus list set, but you want to go back and update your your leadership list. Make sure if there's any stocks that you now deem leaders, you, you add those, you can remove ones that broke down. Uh, you update your universe list, your gappers, IPO, momentum, high tight flag, Rhino, you, you keep those lists. Um, so just make sure that you're staying up to date um, and you're not, you know, you're not letting letting anything fall through the cracks is all I want to know, here. like what people, what watch list people maintain these days, like what, what are the names you've given to your watch list? Um, Maybe, I'm just really curious because I operate within my own little world, so I'm not like too too aware of what people do. Um, that would be nice to know as well. So for me, it's as simple. Gappers relates to my high volume edge. IPO base pattern is the most, you know, uh, when, when the study was done, IPO, you, you want to keep track of IPOs because young bull markets perform really good. Uh, IPO names double and then some in, in, in those type of markets. That's why I keep track of IPOs. I keep track of high tech flags. Everybody knows the stats on those things that double can tend to double again, especially when in an uptrending. That's why I maintain those three. So I'm really curious to know what people are maintaining um, on their end. So I got some stage analysis, IPO, RS new high before price. Makes sense. Yep. Cool. Anything else, Richard, on this update watch list? You're on mute. No, I think that's good. Perfect. All right. So step five, creating a trading plan. So you've got the list on your focus list, but now you have to actually build a plan around that. So for each focus list stock, uh, th these are a few recommendations to do. Uh, list the edges associated with that stock. Again, that's going to kind of train you to look for stocks that have a lot of edges that are, you know, consistent with blueprints of winners. Uh, what setup are you using? What entry tactic do you plan to use? If it's set up really tight, are you using a range breakout? Are you going to use an undercut and rally of this level? You know, write that out in advance, create that plan. Um, think about what position size you're going to use, you know, as a percentage of your total account. Uh, and that, you know, corresponds to a number of shares based on the, the share price. What is your pivot? You know, what's your buy point? Again, uh, what is the likely risk, both percentage wise, as well as dollar wise, that you plan to take when you enter this name, and any other notes that are applicable to that setup, or maybe that environment. Um, always think in if then statements, if the stock do, does this, then I'm going to do this um, and do this for each of the stocks on your focus list. So you're actually ready. You've got that plan right in front of you. And then it's just about executing it properly. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover here. But, you know, again, you want to be disciplined. You want to plan everything in advance. You're not call, calling audibles in the middle, middle of the trading day. Um, you know, uh, especially as a stage one, two trader, you want to stick to this, stick to this routine and make sure you're prepared for, for whatever can happen. Yeah. And you'll go through a phase where you overdo this and then you feel like, Hey, I don't need to do all of this. Right. Um, and you, you move more towards mental math of it, but I think it's, it's very important. I, I, I did this and I still do this. When I struggle, I go back to the basics. So back to simple chart reading, remove everything, have three moving averages, a simple chart. And then am I struggling? Okay, I'm struggling. I need to not be, you know, I can't be, act like I'm still a stage three. But I've moved back to stage two. I'm not seeing progress. Then that's plan. You know, that you go back to being a stage two for a short period of time, then you act like it as well. So then pull out the spreadsheet, write out, these are the stocks I will watch. This will be my entry tactic. This will be my position size. But these are exercises that you do at the end of the day to build yourself that mental math. The focus list part of it and building that never changes. It's more so, do I need to list edges uh, now? Or do I, you know, am I comfortable with that? Uh, am I going to buy the stock at 22, 22 and a half, 25, and then maintain my risk right about 21.5 and then do the mental math and know the percentages that way? You will get to that stage. Don't act like it, right? You, 
in trading fake it to make it doesn't work you have to do actually do it to make it so um so this exercise even though people will label it as overkill uh it takes too much of my time i just want something easier um there is no there's no alternative i would say because you would need to learn you know the mental math side of things what your uh, allocation um uh, where are you positioning? Something that you could add here is, are your positions part of leadership groups? A simple checkbox, right? Is it part of a leadership group that you've defined? If you're saying uranium stocks are leading, energy stocks are leading, and then your exposure is in a software name, it, I've seen that. I've, I, I still see it to this day. They People will build this bias that they can only trade tech semis uh, type of names. Their whole analysis is saying energy names are working, uranium names are working. They will not touch them whatsoever. And then they will go position in a, in a name that's not even a top leadership group. So you contradict yourself and these things happen, but this type of trading plan will allow you to not do that because you're deliberately going to write each, each of that down. So um, perfect. let's go preparation tasks, step five. Yeah. So after you've built the plan, you want to make sure that you're ready to go and you don't have to do stuff the next morning. Um, you want to set any alerts you need to. I set them before that pivot point is reached. So I set, you know, one or two below that level and one at the pivot level. So I make sure I'm aware of a stock moving through that pivot point. Um, you know, people talk about buying as close to that pivot as possible. If you've just got alert set that pivot, it could already be 3% above it by the time that you click the alert and, and actually take a look at the chart. And, you know, if you're scrambling to do some mental math, how many shares do I buy? Um, you know, you're, you're not going to get that ideal entry point. So do as much as you can in advance. And that way you're ready to go when, when the stock is actually pushing through. Um, also adjust any stops you need to on existing positions and uh, anything else that you need to do to prepare for the week. Um, and, you know, be as successful as you can. So yeah, this is pretty much the last step. Anything else that you do um, on, during your weekend routines to make sure you're ready to go that next week, Roy? No, I think uh, I've started using alerts a lot more, um, mostly because it, I'm using, you know, I'm using, the, using them the way uh, Ross uses them. He tracks rotation with alerts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a whole different ball game when you do that uh i i like the idea of you know if this is your pivot set it a couple of points below that not a, you know per, we're talking percentages here so maybe one and a half percent to two percent below the way the market has kind of moved uh and you'll hear you know stan weinstein said this you know multiple times during stage analysis masterclass things have changed things are faster things move faster they go through a pivot there's a lot of um, movement around similar pivots is is a lot more failure prone these days and a lot you know you might set a stock hey 22 is my top side pivot and by the time you look at it it's at 2350 now what do you do right so uh, setting them a little bit earlier looking at it as it makes you know progress into that pivot will allow you to you know be a, a little bit of um, ahead of of the back at the end of the day yep and then step six is just uh, go out and have some fun, do whatever you need to, you know, go on a hike, hang out with friends, play some sports, whatever you need to, to step away from the screens, reset and get ready for the market. Ryan, what do you, what do you like to do? What's, what's your favorite hobby since we're doing a little bit of a podcast here? <laughs> I I mean, I, I like to just not be home for me is kind of important, like not be around in the same space as my well you know where where i'm working per se right just that alone um frees up the mind quite a bit for me so that could mean just uh you know as simple as you know meeting up friends watching sports um uh, going for a hike um you know just to a different city to drive out and you know etc anything that mentally would reset me, but prepare me for Monday. For me, this is the sport that I've chosen to play as a profession. So at the in the back of your mind, you're kind of always thinking about it, right? And that's normal. 
but you don't want to sit there and think think about it. I think that's you know most you want to get away from that space that you associate with you know basically Monday to Friday you're you're as full time. If if you're part time, it's a little bit you know a different story. But the idea is still the same. You want to disconnect. You want to just completely not think about it uh, for as long as possible, especially when you're struggling. I think step six is most important. When you're struggling, it's more important to take time off than continue to press because the market's not aligning. You're doing the same thing. And if it's just not working, you just have to wait and maybe give it a little bit of time because your mind's saturated and your decisions are, you know, are poor based on the same process that used to work a couple of days ago. So, um, yeah. yeah, and I, I think you know, having multiple passions and interests and being multiple, yeah. multiple disciplinary helps you with trading as well. Cause you, you take ideas from playing soccer, you take ideas from a, a book you read that's completely on a different subject and you can incorporate that into your trading. You know, a lot of the best trading books are, you know, a lot of the habit books that people were talking about previously, that's going to help you a lot with, with trading. So um, I do a lot of reading. Like I, I, I like doing a lot of reading, um, could be, you know, stock market books are fine, but more so like different, you know, with respect to different success stories, right? Uh, and we're not done yet, but we have a little more to go. Um, so, uh, yeah, like different success stories, you get inspired to, you know, people have different processes in different fields and you could take them and bring them to trading, right? Because success always has this, you know, very set formula in a way where, people would talk about it and on how they did it in their profession. You could always bring that over. So yeah, I, I, let's I've been going reading. because I, people think we, we're well, done. one last thing. Um, I I've been reading uh, the Steve jobs biography um, and it's really fascinating hearing how he develops products and all that. I'm incorporating that into deep view stuff, not his personal life, but you know, some of his processes, but yeah, we'll, we'll move on. So yeah, this, this last portion here I think is really important, especially uh, when you're 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 getting into that late stage two, stage three, building your own screens, uh, we've got a lot of you know presets and we've shared a lot of great templates today. But we thought we'd share the overall process that that we use to create new ones uh, that are specifically designed. So here are the six key steps that we'll run through. One, you want to very clearly define the purpose and goal of the screen. You should have a clear focus in mind as you go into um, the screen builder and start selecting conditions. Uh, to help define this purpose, what you want to do is, in step two is identify um, a few model stocks that kind of serve as the blueprint, um, where at this moment in time, I want to find stocks that look like X. And that could be both from a fundamental or technical perspective. Then you want to break down these model, books, model book stocks and define their characteristics at that point. Again, from a technical and fundamental side of things. Then just very quickly create a first iteration using those data points. Uh, in step five, you wanna analyze the results from that first iteration, and then becomes the process of tweaking and updating the criteria, adding a data point. Oh, I actually wanna take this away. Just consistently and repeatedly update the screen until it's getting closer to what you're trying to accomplish with with your goal in mind. Uh, there's never going to be a perfect screen. There's not going to be a magic screen that you know prints out all the winners. Uh, but what you can do is is develop really solid both general screens as well as specialist screens um, that help you speed up your routines and get you closer to you know optimizing uh, your processes. So th these are the six key steps, and we'll run through each of these um, to dive a little bit deeper. All right. And also one of yeah, the things ahead. is when we did the price action reading, right, of uh, Tesla and some of these stocks in, in one of the first webinars, it you can always say, hey, how do I get something like looking like this on my radar, right? That's could be a purpose that you, you know, I want to see tight stocks on my screen. Uh, then you work your way backwards. Hey, Tesla from this pivot moved up. These are pivots that I want to identify or at least have on my radar. And then you work your way back to building one, right? So as Mike Webster is the king of this stuff, like he's he has too many <laughs> screens. Uh, he and he would say, you know, too many is not a word uh, when it comes to screening. But he that's how he works. He looks at patterns. He sees them. Uh, he has a different screen for different 
type of day, right? Um, when he wants to see leadership, when he wants to see relative strength, when he, when he wants to see uh, in a bad economy, uh, good stocks that will act well in a bad economy type. He's the king of screening, I would say. So uh, always be curious. You know, if you want, if you want to say, hey, I want to cash this stock, we've all said it. All you know, two hundred of you that that are live have said you know this exact same thing. But then work your way backwards to building it, and then making that part of your process, because that that's how you it yields results, right? At the end of the day. So let's get into the you know define the purpose. Yeah. So again, it, it's very important to be very specific with your goal in mind as you start this process. So basically, fill out this prompt up here. I am designing a screen that looks for stocks that blank. Um, you want to think, do I want to design a general screen versus specialist screen? They're going to be very, very different. Uh, think about when you want to use this screen. Is it is it anywhere in the market cycle? Is it just in a developing new up, you know, uptrend or, you know, a developing downtrend looking for short ideas? Whatever the purpose is in mind, you want to think of these different aspects of it. And I think I've got, I've got some more leading questions on the next slide here. Um, yeah, so here are some some questions to help you with this. Do I want to cast a wide net with a screen or yield only a select group of stocks? What type of setup am I looking for from a technical basis or fundamental basis? What will be my time frame or trading stocks from the screen? So is this more of a swing trading type setup or a position trade setup or an investing setup? Uh, that's going to change what the screen will look like. Um, and also, and this leads us, leads us into the next step. What stock situation blueprint am I looking for with the screen? What's what is what are the ideal results that you want to see every time uh, you run this? That's that's what you should be thinking about. So that leads us into step two here. Identify your model stock. So the first thing you want to do is brainstorm five different stocks slash situations that you would want this screen to highlight. Um, and then from those five stocks, you want to think about which is the number one blueprint. Uh, that I can choose from these that I'll basically base my initial screen around. You always want to refer back to these five stocks and whether the stock would have the, the stock screen would have ca caught them. Uh, but you want to you know make the screen at least the first iteration with just one in mind. That makes it a lot faster, a lot easier. Next up, uh, looking at that model book stock, that blueprint, uh, break down its characteristics. What does the company look like? What's the market cap? Uh, how many, what's its average volume? How many shares is it trading? Uh, then look at its technicals. Is it above the 50 SMA at that point in time? Is it forming a pocket pivot? Um, really break down the technical data points and list out the characteristics that you would want. Uh, then do the exact same thing from the fundamental perspective. What data points um, do you want to look at uh, that, that create this blueprint? EPS growth last quarter, estimates, um, you know, uh, all, all those different stuff, whatever you want to incorporate into the screen, you want to list out um, both from a technical and fundamental perspective. And on the next slide, we've got some helpful data points that uh, we use often in our screens, dollar volume, RS, AS score, um, average dollar, uh, average daily range percentage, percentage versus SMA, EMA, I won't read all of these, but, um, you know, a lot of these are built into DFU and we find are really helpful for identifying uh, different leaders. Ryan, any of these that you want to really highlight? I I use absolute strength uh, a lot more these days. Um, DCR is always the go to 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 compare what you know, what my focus list is doing versus the market. Very easy visual way. Um, recently, the EPS uh, estimates is something that I've been looking into a lot more. So the first time the, you know, a company in its life cycle is estimated for positive earnings, it seems to be kind of like a, a flick, uh, flip the switch, switch in terms yeah. of how it trades is mm -hmm. a lot different, you know? Uh, so something like, so many of these stocks that have been running up in the recent cycle where, their EPS estimates on a quarterly basis uh, will be, you know, the first time uh, ever they'll be positive or they're expecting positive growth in that area. 
we all know the whole sales story. That's a whole separate thing. Um, you know, sale, names can be driven by sales, have no earnings as well. That That's a theme that's existed in the markets for five to seven years now. So um, a lot of, you know, trend stuff is built into my screens, something like uh, percent from highs and percent from lows. I, I know Minervini's templates account for those. Um, but yeah, I keep it really, really simple when it comes to that. But I do experiment a lot. And, you know, I would say 70 to 80 percent of the stuff never makes it to my real process. But I'm always, you know, tweaking, tweaking, looking at things that um, studying them. But what makes it to my process is when I'm super confident that this will help me only then it will filter out and actually, you know, I'll go in, update my weekend routine workflow and and make it or incorporate it as part of my process. So like RMV, uh, we're going to continuously re refine that, make it better. And it's, you know, for me, I feel like it's it's a really good scan I could add on a weekly or even a daily basis to, to see tight stocks um, in the markets relatively, you know, very quickly, right? So... Yeah, and one one more that's not on here that I'll mention uh, the EPI EPS surprise. I think that's a really interesting metric to to incorporate into screens because again, we've talked about expectation breakers in terms of the the technicals, you know, and that's a great entry tactic. But from a fundamental perspective, that's what's going to turn a lot of heads uh, from institutions when when stocks beat estimates and continuously do that. So that's another metric that you can use. Uh, so once you've got a list of both the technicals and fundamentals, the next step is to go ahead, put them all together, assign some criteria and create your first iteration, which is the next step here. Yep. Uh, so some things to remember here, it's not going to be perfect. It does not have to be perfect. Um, just create some, some starter screen for you. And then even in that first, you know, actually putting in the criteria, there's going to be some initial tweaks that you realize you have to make um, or data points that you have to add. So just go ahead, create that first iteration, create that prototype, um, and then you can build off that and really get uh, to closer to that fin final product. So moving on here, you want to analyze the results, uh, look at the charts and fundamentals of the results. Do they match what your template blueprint looks like uh if they don't you know what's different what what do you need to tweak what do you need to take out um add in uh both from a fundamental or technical perspective just keep an open mind and and try to think out outside the box here in different ways that you can uh match your your screen to uh that ideal blueprint then it's just a kind of continuous cycle of you know updating it tweaking it based on the market environment, uh, changing market cycles. Um, you'll always need to go back and update criteria. Uh, maybe, you know, stocks, all of them have gotten destroyed in a bear market and, you know, there's no stock above its 50 SMA. Maybe then to, to track strength, you need to open that up to above the 21 EMA. Um, you know, you're always going to go in there and, and continuously tweak things. But uh, the key thing to remember is no screen will ever be perfect. Uh, the goal is to filter out most of the noise. You're going to, you know, filter out some stocks that were, that go on to be huge winners, but the goal is to get the majority of those high potential stocks through your system, through your screen. Thanks. Yep. And for brainstorming ideas, uh, definitely go through um, some top trader screens. We've got a lot of them in, in deep view from Kualmagi, Leif Serede. He's got a high type flag scan in there. That's another great specialist screen to look at. Uh, we've got a lot of Mike Webster screen there, Oliver Kell, uh, and we've got a lot of other screens as well, stuff that I've created, Rise created um, as well. So these are great for um, ideation, thinking of ideas. Uh, so that's just another way to brainstorm ideas and people share a lot on Twitter as well of uh, things that they use. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, we, we've talked a lot about screening today, and this is the screening tool that we're developing and continue to improve, uh, DeepView. Uh, you can visit deepview.com if you want to learn more. Um, highly recommend it. We're always improving it and taking into account uh, all the user feedback. Uh, so yeah, with that, I think, uh, Ryan, anything you want to leave everybody with today? No, I think, um, I hope you, you know, everybody found it useful. Um, it, it's a key part of 
the the bigger frameworks that we are uh you know the the six you know six seven eight frameworks that we think are important when it comes to trading and investing um people don't pay attention to this because they think it's optional i don't think it's optional it's likely the reason you're you are stage one and two right uh, you can have if you have hey uh, i went to a webinar two, three, and four, I have edges, I have entry tactics, and I'm not seeing results. Well, it might be the routines, right? It's usually that one thing that's causing you um, the problem or an issue in terms of you graduating to the next stage. So each of these frameworks are, I would say, equally as important. And when you put them together, that's when they're most powerful, right? That's what we want you guys to focus on is no one uh, framework is less important than the other framework. They kind of all talk to each other and work together to to mold you, you know, and your success in the in the trading and investing world. So, yep, perfect. Uh, with that, I think we can pretty much uh, call this one here. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in uh, to us. Thanks for your great questions and feedback. Um, and uh, to everybody watching the recording, thanks for sticking around until the end. Make sure to leave a like down below, uh, subscribe to the channel, and also check out the other uh, webinars in the playlist as well. So uh, with that, thanks so much for uh, joining us today on this Saturday, and we look forward to seeing you guys in future webinars and videos. So take care. Bye. Thank you, guys. Have a good weekend.